In this segment, we'll understand some important data analytics concepts. Okay, suppose we have a lot of data. So I'm just showing you a small fragment of a large data set that we may have. The details are not very important in this case. Now, what can you do when you have a lot of data with analytics? Well, one thing we could do, there are two things we can do. The first thing would be to just explore the data, right? Often, we want to just understand what the data is telling us. What are the kind of patterns that are there in the data? And, you know, what are some interesting things that we can cull out of this data? So that's called exploratory data analysis. Okay, so we're just exploring. There's no predetermined idea of what we are looking for. We're just saying, okay, there's a lot of data. Let's see how things are going on here. Okay. And as part of exploration, we may generate a lot of charts, you know, getting a visual idea of what the data looks like. And we may also try to identify, you know, uh, for example, it is possible that data are all divided into different kinds of clusters. You know, it's not that you've got a lot of data and it's distributed all over the place. There's a chunk here, there's a chunk there, there's another, another chunk there, and so on. Okay, so these are all examples of exploratory data analysis. On the other hand, quite often what we are looking for in analytics in business is especially the ability to predict the future. Right? In other words, we want to say, okay, given a person with these demographic characteristics, will they buy our product or not? Or alternately, what is the probability that they will buy our product? Okay? Or alternately, you may say, well, uh, given that we've got historical information on stock prices. We may want to say, well, what is going to be the stock price of this particular stock tomorrow? We may want to predict the stock price or predict the GDP or predict the sales of a particular company in the next year and so on. Okay, so all those things are called predictive analytics. We want to predict something about the future based upon historical information that we have. Okay, so we may want to predict the price, the GDP of some country. Will somebody buy our product or not? Will somebody default on a loan? Things like that. Those are all predictive analytics that we may want to do. Here are some things that people typically do with data analytics. Okay, there are two kinds of predictive analytics. As you can see here, the first two items are generally considered as predictive analytics when we are trying to predict something. But in prediction, we have two types of things we may predict. One is called classification. That is, we are given something, we just want to classify it as falling into one of a few buckets. For example, suppose there is a tax return that's been filed to the IRS. The IRS may want to look at the tax return and figure out, is this a proper tax return or is it a fraudulent return? Or alternately, a credit card transaction takes place. You know, you go to a store, uh, you swipe a card, or alternately, you've got, let's say, American Express, and there's a card transaction taking place against your credit card, right? Now, American Express, the credit card company, might want to find out, is this a regular transaction, or is it likely to be a fraudulent transaction? If it's a fraudulent transaction, they want to immediately call you and let you know that this probably a fraudulent transaction has occurred, right? So here... Given a transaction, they're only trying to say, is it fraudulent? Is it not fraudulent? Or in the case of IRS, given a tax return, they would just want to say, is this a proper return or is it a fake or fraudulent return? Okay. Or alternately, uh, you may say, well, here's a person. We've got demographic information. Are they going to buy our product? Are they not going to buy our product? Okay. Or uh, uh, let's say uh, a bank has given a loan to somebody or is considering giving loan to somebody, uh, loan to somebody, and the bank may want to determine, is this person uh, a good person in terms of you know, loan repayment, or are they going to be defaulters? Okay, so all of these are classifications. You take some, uh, some particular thing, and then you want to divide it into one of few categories. Of course, all the examples I gave are all examples in which we had only two categories, you know, fraudulent, not fraudulent, buyer, not buyer, defaulter, non-defaulter, but you could have multiple categories. Right. For example, uh, let's say you have a bunch of automobiles and you want to classify them as, uh, you know, uh, good, moderate, bad. 
So you could have three categories. Okay, so that is classification. It is considered predictive analytics because you're trying to make a prediction about the future, right? That uh, here's a tax return that's being filed. We don't know if it's fraudulent or not. You know, it, what is the classification to which it belongs? It is predictive analytics. Okay. On the other hand, you also have another kind of predictive analytic in which you're not trying to predict a class, but you're trying to predict an actual number for something like we discussed earlier. Right? You may want to predict the price tomorrow. You may want to predict the sales of a company. You may want to predict the price for which a particular home would sell. Or you've got a used car, a dealership is thinking of acquiring a used car for somebody from somebody. They may want to say, okay, given all these characteristics, you know, the brand, the age of the car, its condition, uh, how many miles it's been driven, etc. Given all of that, how much can they expect to sell it for? Right? So that's a number that they're putting on it. It is also predictive, but you're not just putting into one of a few categories. Instead, you're saying uh, predicting a number for it. Okay, So those two things fall under predictive analytics. One is classification, the other is regression. And there are a lot of techniques that we look at in this course for both of these activities. Okay, Another common kind of data analytics activity that we do is called affinity analysis. Okay, affinity analysis has been used quite a lot in stores. So when you buy some item, companies, uh, the you know retail companies or you know companies that sell products, they want to find out people who buy these items generally also buy which other items. Okay, so that they can recommend some items to you, right? So they can send out a brochure to you. Uh, you know, you bought one item, they can give you a coupon for a related item because it's very likely that you will buy that item. Okay, so that is called affinity analysis. Uh, another kind of analytics activity is sometimes you have data and your data has a huge number of attributes, right? So you have a, a data file with, a, with 100 attributes, okay? Now, you may not want to use all of these 100 attributes as predictive attributes. So you may say, well, let me condense this and identify the, the 10 most important attributes among these. Or alternately, let us put combine some attributes together and have only 10 attributes or 12 attributes or have those attributes which contribute most of the information in this data set okay that is called data reduction and we will be looking at one of those techniques in the course okay data exploration we've already looked at it exploratory analysis data exploration and visualization are both preliminary data analysis techniques you've got a large file you're just looking for patterns, right? You're, you're literally playing with it and trying to understand what is going on in this data set. What are the interesting patterns? Let's take a concrete example of where classification techniques might be useful. Let us say you're a, a dealer, uh, you're a manager of a sports car dealership and you're trying to create a promotion for one of the cars, new cars that you've got. Right, so let's say you have a $7 color brochure that you printed, pretty expensive, and you're thinking of sending out several invitations to qualified people to test drive the car and also you know, join the dealership for a fancy dinner. Okay, now obviously this is an expensive proposition and uh, the, you have budget to send out this invitation to at most a thousand people. Okay, looks like this is a high-end car, so you can spend quite a lot on this. Okay, now you've got demographic information for 30,000 people in your, you know, in the area in which the dealership is located. Okay, now how do you find 1,000 people to whom you should mail the brochures? Okay, that's an important decision. Now one thing you could do is to randomly select 1,000 people from 30,000 and then send out the brochures okay but that may not work out too well because you know you may have a lot of people who just come uh, you know test drive the vehicle for fun enjoy dinner at your expense and they're not likely to buy at all right and you cannot just go on single specific criteria like okay let's send it to the richest people in town well it may be the case that you know people who are simply rich may not be the ones who buy the car maybe there are some people who are not as rich but who are interested in sports cars and they may actually be better candidates to buy the sports car. Okay, it could be 
that there are young people who are you know just fresh into their jobs high paying jobs maybe they are the ones who will buy these uh, sports cars or maybe not even high paying about jobs but you know they have a desire to own this and they want to do it okay so we do not know that just income or just wealth or just a few criteria will predict it so what we would like to do then is to use historical information and try to find out who are the people who are most likely to buy a sports car okay so let's say we've got data on 50000 historical observations right in other words 50000 people in the past to whom you've made such offers and who have either purchased the car or not purchased the sports car when i say owner non owner i really mean they bought or did not buy okay and for each person i'm just showing you two possible attributes uh, household income and their education level okay I've just thrown in some information here. Ideally, we would not be using just, obviously, we would not be using just two attributes. We'd be using a lot more attributes, you know, 10, 15, 20 attributes, right? So how might we use this historical information to build a model or to predict whether somebody, given their attributes, you know, we have shown two here, two here, but there could be many more. Given all those attributes, will they buy or not buy? Okay, so that's what we're looking at. So, uh, so the attribute of interest for us in this example is ownership, right? That is what we are trying to predict. Given the other information, will the person buy or not? Okay, ownership or you could call it whether they will buy or not. Okay, and we'll use the term target attribute to talk about such attributes, right? So target attribute is the attribute whose value we want to predict. We are building a model to predict the target attribute and of course we will base the model on all of the not all of the other attributes or some of the other attributes which we call as predictor attributes okay so when we are given a data set we have a target attribute and we have a bunch of predictor attributes now nobody says we are supposed to use all the attributes to build our model it could turn out that some attributes are useless we may simply leave them out and not use them in model building okay so that's what the terminology is here how do you identify the quality of such a model that you built right okay you built a model for predicting obviously we're not going to get exactly correct predictions for everything the model is not going to be a 100 percent correct model if that were possible then things would be vastly different that's not the case okay so how do you evaluate the quality okay in traditional statistics, we had to draw inferences based on limited data. So, for example, when you consider, uh, when you, uh, you know, look at traditional statistics and the concepts they employ, the assumption on which traditional statistical theory was built was that we have limited amount of data, we have limited amount of processing capability to process the data, right? With those limitations, statisticians brilliant statisticians developed theories by which you could make very good inferences based on only a small amount of data right so for example you have an entire country but let's say you want to predict something for the entire country you don't go and you know talk to everybody in the country to find out what's going on you use a small sample of let's say a couple of thousand people and then based on that sample properly selected sample of a couple of thousand people then you calculate whatever it is that you have uh, of the property of interest just for the sample and based on that you extrapolate to the entire population okay now obviously you may say well the country has almost 300 million people and you're taking a sample of you know 5000 how can the 5000 sample illustrate something about 300 million people that's the beauty of traditional statistics right they cannot say exactly this is what the answer is going to be but they can say within this range of probability we expect that this is going to be the result right so not only can they calculate a result but they can also give you an estimate of you know how likely is it that it's going to be wrong okay so that was all the statistical theory that was developed okay so that is how model quality was established in traditional statistics. They used all kinds of probabilistic arguments and intelligent number crunching to say, okay, uh, 
uh, we know that the actual mean salary for this particular state will be within uh, you know let's say thirty thousand dollars to thirty five thousand dollars and we are 95 percent confident that that's the range in which it falls right so they can never say with certainty this is what the value is but they can say we are fairly certain that it's going to be in this range and that gives you good information okay but when you look at predictive analytics the scenario is actually quite different from traditional statistics okay these days with the amount of ability we have to gather data and process data and so on positive of data is usually not the case we have lots and lots of data okay so most of the time establishing model quality is a lot easier with predictive analytics because we have a lot of data so the difficulties uh, that caused traditional statisticians to come out with all kinds of innovative methods though some of those difficulties have been removed okay that is one big difference between traditional statistics and predictive analytics